All right, everyone. Uh, welcome back. And to those of you who are just joining us, welcome. Um, so so uh, before we begin, let me just remark. So we have a ongoing Google Doc in which people are commenting and asking questions. Um, and if you have a question you want to ask other people uh, in the audience and not necessarily the speaker, you can type it there or there's a space to type questions for me to ask the speaker if you're, if you're, uh, if you're feeling shy. Uh, if you'd like to ask the speaker a question in general, you can click the raise hand button under the list of participants to see that click participants. And then when the speaker gets to a good stopping point, they will call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, all right, so without further ado then, it's my real pleasure to introduce Hannah Larson from Stanford, who will be telling us about a refined brill nerder theory over Horowitz spaces. And uh, Hannah, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, thanks for organizing this. And thank you to everyone for joining me on Zoom today. I'm really excited to try this out with you all. So this talk is about some recent results on the theory of algebraic curves. And I'll just get started with our motivating question. which is given a smooth projective curve C, what are all maps of C into some projective space? So here's my picture of a curve in projective space. And this curve meets a general hyperplane in a finite set of points. And the number of points is called the degree of the map. And I'm going to ask this question uh, for each degree. And furthermore, as I ask this question for each r, I'm going to be interested in the maps that don't factor through a smaller projective space. So all right here, non-degenerate maps to mean that this curve doesn't land inside some hyperplane in PR. This question is really about relating two perspectives on the theory of algebraic curves. On the one hand here, we have curves in projective space, which is historically how um, curves were studied, always uh, thought of in some ambient space. But we also have a notion of abstract curves. which are parameterized by some moduli space mg of genus g curves. And so I'll just draw here over the complex numbers. This is parameterizing g hold Riemann surfaces. And our question is, given some curve, what are all of the ways of realizing that curve as sitting inside of some projective space? And we can rephrase this question in terms of line bundles on our curve. So there's a correspondence between degree D maps from C to PR and the data of a degree D line bundle on my curve. So here, pick D is going to be the space of degree D line bundles on C. Uh, so a line bundle together uh, with R plus one global sections that have uh, no common zeros. So the way this works is if I have a collection of sections, say sigma zero through sigma r, of some line bundle L, then I can obtain a map to projective space 
by just sending each point on my curve to the ratios of the values of my sections at that point. And going in the other direction, if I have a map from my curve to projective space, I can uh, obtain naturally a collection of r plus 1 global sections by uh, pulling back the coordinate functions on r and the associated line bundle is the pullback of O of 1 from projective space. So this motivates the following definition. You're going to define the Brill motor locus, WRD of C, to be the collection of line bundles that have a hope of giving us a map to a uh, projective space of dimension R. So this will be L in pick E uh, so that H naught of L is at least R plus one. So if these varieties, WRD, are nested inside of pick D. And here is how I like to picture it. Anna, there's a question. Yep. Um, in the correspondence, do you mod out by some isomorphisms on the left-hand side? Um, here? Or? Um, so um, I guess I'll just say, there, I prob maybe the question is whether I want to be thinking of maps to a projective R space where I've chosen a, uh, a basis for that vector space versus if I haven't. Um, and um, what we're looking at um, in terms of WID though is really uh, the line bundles that could give us a map. So for each line bundle here, um, I could, there's still uh, remaining the choice of what global sections I'm going to pick. And you can think of those as equivalent maps if you like, or uh, not depending. But um, for the purposes of what I'm going to be saying in this talk, I'm really interested uh, primarily in WRD, which is just the space of line bundles. Is there, does that answer the question, perhaps? OK, I'll, I'll continue. But please do ask questions in the chat. OK, so here's my picture of pick D. Um, and inside of it, um, I have here W0D. This corresponds to line bundles that have a non-zero global section. So this is corresponding to effective divisors on my curve. And then inside of W0D, there'll be W1D which corresponds to maps of my curve to P1. And then even more special, I have W2D, which corresponds to ways of realizing my curve in the plane. And for the purposes of something I'm going to say later in the talk, I'd like you to think of this as a black and white picture where the darkness at each point corresponds to the number of global sections of that line bundle. So the answer to our original question when C is a general curve is given by 
the grill noted here. the real Noether theorem as describing this black and white picture. So it says if C is a general curve of genus G, then first off, we know the dimension of WRD. And it's equal to G minus R plus one times G minus D plus R. And this quantity is called the Brill Noether number and is denoted rho of G R D. This is due to And uh, it's saying that, uh, in particular, when this quantity rho is negative, I mean that WRD is empty. The fact that uh, WRD is non-empty when rho is greater than or equal to zero was actually proved first um, and is attributed to M and Simon. of the real number theorem is that WRD is smooth away from WR plus 1D. You can see, as I draw in this picture, um, you know, W1D could be singular, but those singular points will live in uh, a deeper stratum. This is the Giesecker And finally, um, WRD is irreducible when its dimension is positive. So in the case when rho equals zero, uh, WRD is a finite set of points, and there could be more than one. This is uh, due to Halton and Lazarsfeld. So I'll stop and check. Are there any questions here? Okay, so this is the answer to our question when C is a general curve. And what I want to talk about in this talk is how this theorem breaks down for some special curves and what the new story should be for those curves. The curves that I'm interested in are curves of low gonality. Right, defining the gonality of a curve, see, it's the minimum of a map of my curve to P1. I think of P1 as being, in some sense, the simplest curve. And so gonality is some measurement of how far away from P1 is my curve. And now another notion of how far away from P1 is my curve is the genus of the curve. Um, and it turns out that, in general, for general curves, these two invariants, the venality and the genus, uh, are nicely related. Uh, 
of genus G, then finality is equal to the ceiling of G plus 2 over 2. This actually follows from the brill Miller theorem because we're asking for the smallest k so that this brill Miller number is greater than or equal to zero. When is w1k first non-empty? But if um, the finality is small compared to the genus, then the curves in mg, which I'm going to draw in pink, the curves where the gonality is less than or equal to k uh, form some special locus in the moduli space of curves. And this locus is dominated by a nice smooth moduli space, uh, which is called the Hurwitz space. It's the moduli space of degree k covers of P1. So now let me give you an example of one of these special curves where the brill Miller theorem fails. So let's uh, consider curves of genus 6, which in general would have gonality 4. Uh, but if I look instead at curves of gonality 3, uh, we'll see something interesting happen. So here's my picture of a degree 3 cover of P1. And I'm going to mark here in pink. There's some, this means that I have some uh, degree 3 line bundle with at least two global sections. And now I'm going to consider uh, the variety um, W14 of C. So degree 4 line bundles with at least two global sections. This uh, will consist of, in particular, the line bundles where I take that uh, degree 3 line bundle and I just add a base point. There's also something else in W14 for a trigonal curve of genus 6 in general, which is a trigonal curve of genus 6 in general um, lies on P1 cross P1 as a curve of by degree 3, 4. So that other map to P1 corresponds to a degree, another degree four line bundle with two global sections. And so W14 um, actually has two components, and the two components have different dimensions. And just for context, expected dimension in this case is zero. So this component here uh, has larger than the expected dimension. So let me tell you now some known about there's a 
question. Oh, a question. Is it clear the single G14 is not contained in the curve of G13 plus P's? Um, yeah, this, this map, it, I mean, it doesn't have a base point. What I'm saying is that my curve honestly lies on P1 cross P, like on P1 cross P. And so, and to say that um, this is a map of degree four to P1 is to say that um, it actually doesn't have any base points. That. Is there more? Are there more questions about this um, isolated G14? Okay. Okay. Um, so some known results uh, in 2000 and 2004. Opens and Martins proved that for all alpha dividing R or R plus one, uh, WRD has a component. Oh, sorry, I should say these are known results for C, a general genus B. Finality K curve. So in that case, um, WRD has a component of dimension rho G alpha minus one D minus R plus one minus alpha times K. And if back in our example over here, um, these two components we found of different dimensions corresponded to the cases alpha equals one and alpha equals two. You have a question? Here? Yeah. Sorry, what's what the question? Raise their hand. Oh, still on, um, go ahead. Still on these uh, G14s, what are their duals as G26s? I see. Um, for for a general no, for a general G six, sorry, do du, dual to a G one four is a G two six. What are the duals to these? Oh, the the stair dual. Um, so. Um. Let's, so uh, the canonical is G, wait, so G26, so you're saying this corresponds to, to correspond to some degree six map to the plane, and you want to see um, the geometry of that from this uh, curve sitting on P1 cross P1. Yeah, and if it's, uh, if it, I don't mean to derail you, but, uh, please go on. Sure, yeah, maybe we can uh, come back to it later. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay, so, so right, so this um, example, as I was saying, is uh, part of a more general phenomenon observed by Copens and Martins, uh, which, uh, finds components of WRD of different dimensions. Um, and in 2016, uh, Nathan Flieger proved that the dimension of WRD is always at most the maximum over L in some range, uh, zero up to R prime, where R prime is minimum R G minus E minus one of formula 
symbol is like this, rho g l, rho g r minus l d minus l times k. Now let me point out that the maximum um, of, as I range over l in this range of these quantities is not narrowly um, covered by some corresponding uh, value of alpha in the work of Copens and Martins. But nevertheless, uh, in 2017, Dave Jensen and Drew Ranganathan uh, established that the dimension of WRD is in fact equal to this maximum. So this determines the dimension of the largest component of WRD. But it still remains the question uh, what are the dimensions of all components of WRD and also uh, where are they moved? So uh, in their work, Lieber, Jensen, and Ranganathan conjecture that every component of WRD has a dimension given by a formula of this type. So it turns out that uh, the answer to this mystery of different components of different dimensions can be explained by looking at a refined stratification of the Picard variety. This refined stratification comes from the following basic observation. So if a degree k over c to p1 um, and a line bundle on c, then the push forward by f of l is a right k bundle on p1. And every vector bundle on P1 splits as a direct sum of line bundles. So I can write the push forward so as sum sum O of E1 through O of Ek for integers E1 through Ek. And I'm going to assume that uh, these integers are non-decreasing. And also, I like to abbreviate this direct sum of line bundles by O of vector E. The upshot is just there's a very natural way of associating to each line bundle a tuple of k integers, which I'm going to call the splitting type. And then to keep track of which line bundles uh, push forward to something with a certain splitting type will define sigma e of cf to be precisely that. Those line bundles L so that the push forward is O of vector e. Now, an important observation is that this splitting type 
E is determined by knowing the numbers of H naught one P one push forward twisted by M or all integers M. So why that is is just if M is very negative. I have no global sections. Uh, as I increase m, the first time I see a global section uh, tells me the degree of the largest sum end. Uh, then as I increase m, I know by how much I expect the global sections to increase. But if it increases by more, that detects a next largest sum end, and I just continue in this way. On the other hand, I can also write the this uh, H naught as H naught on the curve of L twisted by M times H, where uh, H may be a pullback of the O of 1 on P1. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna do an example soon, um, but I'm also gonna I want to set just a bit of notation first uh, for working with stratifications that arise in this way so by by splitting type of vector bundles on P1. So it turns out that uh, splitting type E can specialize to splitting type E prime uh, exactly uh, when the partial sum of the prime numbers that's less than or equal to the partial sums without the primes. And when that's true, I'm going to write that vector E prime is less than or equal to vector E. So this defines some partial ordering on our set of splitting types. And these should be, of course, the same rank and degree for me to compare them. And then I'll define sigma e with a bar on top of it to be the union over e prime less than or equal to e of, of sigma e prime. This is something that I expect to be the closure of sigma e, although as I've defined it, uh, it doesn't have to be. Um, although it will be in the case that I'm talking about. And then each of these uh, splitting loci has an expected dimension. And uh, the expected dimension of sigma e will be denoted u of vector e, which is to be H1 tend OV, uh, which you can also write a bit more concretely as the sum over J greater than I of max zero EJ minus EI minus one. So this is sort of measuring how far apart uh, the degrees of the different sum ends are. And finally, um, if u of e is zero, so that would mean that all of the sum ends are within one of each other. Uh, we call uh, e balanced. That's what we expect the generic behavior to be. 
Okay, now I'm gonna switch to screen share on my iPad for this next example. Okay, so this example is uh, with curves of genus 5, uh, which in, in general would have finality uh, 4, but we're going to look at those of finality 3. Um, and we're going to consider the degree 4 line bundles on these curves. Um, and so their, their push forward is going to be a rank 3 uh, degree minus 3 vector bundle on P1. And what I've drawn here are the possible splitting types that you might see. Uh, so in black, uh, that's the balanced splitting type, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. And the expected codimension is 0. And then in green here, um, we see splitting type minus 2, minus 1, 0. And this means that um, the push forward of L, and therefore L, has a global section. So this is the locus W04. Um, and its co-dimension is 1. So then in red, um, splitting type minus 2, minus 2, 1 is expected co-dimension 4. So this is some curve inside of uh, the Picard variety. And I can actually tell you exactly what this curve is. So the splitting type minus 2, minus 2, 1 uh, is determined by the condition that if I twist down by 1 on P1, I still have a global section. Uh, and writing that uh, in terms of cohomology on our curve, that's the line bundle so that when I twist down by H, I still have a global section. And twisting down by H should leave me with something of degree 1, which is effective. So this is precisely the line bundles, which are H plus a base point P on my curve. Now, similarly, in blue, uh, we have something which is expected co-dimension 4. Um, and the splitting type minus 3, 0, 0 uh, is determined by the condition that actually if I twist up by H on, if I twist up by 1 on P1, um, I still have non-zero H1. Um, and so writing that on my curve, that's the line bundles where the twist up by H has non-zero H1. And then by Sarah duality, this is the line bundles of the form k minus h minus q for q, a point on my curve. And these red and blue curves meet in the splitting locus minus 3, minus 1, 1, whose expected co-dimension is 5. And well, this now I just have to tell you which um, which things of the are of both of the red form and the blue form, and that will be the line bundles H plus P naught and H plus Q naught, where P naught plus Q naught represents K minus Q H. And all together, these uh, make up W14. So we should think now of this splitting stratification as adding color to our black and white picture from before. The reason that a black and white picture might have more than one piece of the same grayscale is because they're actually different colors. 
And just as you can make a grayscale copy of any color picture, uh, if we understand this splitting stratification, uh, we'll be able to answer our question about WRD. So are there any questions about this example before I go back to the board? Questions. Yeah. What what is the question? Jordan Ellenberg? Yeah. If we had done this, uh, if we had done this with generic analogy. Uh, yeah. So this is going to work. Um, actually, for any degree cover, you can make this splitting stratification, um, and you will find that sort of the only. Um, there, there is only one way to achieve um, a splitting type with a certain number of global sections that is maximal among a partial ordering. But maybe, let me uh, say the next thing I'm going to say, and I think it will answer uh, Jordan's question. Oh, would we see the original picture? No, there will be some refinement, but the refinement will be, in some sense, totally ordered. Okay, I'm going to stop the screen share. And now um, I'm going to start uh, spelling out the relationship between splitting loci and WRD. the definitions I've made so far, um, WRD is equal to the union over splitting types E such that H naught O of E is at least R plus one of sigma E. And that in turn is equal to the union over splitting types that are maximal with respect to the partial ordering among those satisfying H naught O of E greater than or equal to I plus one of sigma E with the bar. And it turns out that these um, maximal splitting types among those with a certain number of global sections will correspond to the different components of WRD. And so let's, let's describe uh, what those splitting types look like. Um, so I claim any such maximal uh, is of the form, what I'll call balanced plus balanced. Um, where that means that there's some part which is where all of the parts are negative and within one of each other. And there's then uh, the non-negative summands, which are all um, also within one of each other. So just for example, something like minus four, minus three, two, two. And since our rank and degree is fixed, any such splitting type is determined by the number of non-negative parts. Uh, and so if this has, let's say, R plus 1 minus L non-negative parts, then I'm going to call it uh, little w r l. So going back to the example I had before, um, splitting type 
minus 2 minus 2, 1. That's a balance plus balance. I would call that uh, W1, 1, 1. And the, the blue splitting type, which was minus 3, 0, 0, I would call little w, 1, 0. So I like to think of these as being sort of like the primary colors in our picture. So to go back to Jordan's question, you would see that all of the primary colors are comparable in the partial ordering. So then there are actually no new primary colors and you would recover sort of the same information that you had before. All right, so now um, let me just rewrite what we know in, in terms of this notation. So now we have that WRD is the union over L of sigma sub WRL bar and uh, the work of Klinger, uh, Jensen, and Ranganathan can actually be rewritten to say that the dimension of WRD of C is equal to the maximum over L of G minus U of WRL. So that expression that we had before actually just turns out to be G minus the expected co-dimension of one of these balance plus balance splitting types. So now, let me state the theorem. And the theorem concerns of uh, all parts of this stratification. As that if um, one is a general genus G degree K cover, then for all E, Splitting locus sigma E is smooth of dimension G minus U of E. So when G minus U of E is negative, I'm meaning to tell you that uh, sigma E is empty. And let me just clarify this smoothness really is for the open part of the stratification. And now with the same uh, hypotheses, we can answer the question about WRD from the beginning. So this, together with this form, will tell us that every component of WRD is generically smooth of dimension G minus U W R L for some L. So that answers in the affirmative the conjecture of Flieger, Jensen, and Ranganathan. And I can also say exactly which L um, makes this quantity the dimension of such a component. It just should be those L where if I uh, write down this particular balance plus balance uh, splitting type, it really is maximal in the partial ordering. Uh, and it turns out that that condition is that 
L is between the maximum of 0 and R plus 2 minus K and R. And either L is 0 or L is less than or equal to G minus E plus 2R plus 1 minus K. And such a component exists exactly when G minus mu WRL is non negative. So, any questions here? Maybe I will try to ask something. Uh, so, so does this give you a description of just all the irreducible components of WRD? Well, I haven't told you um, if each of these sigma e's is irreducible or not. Um, and that is current joint work in progress with Isabel and uh, Eric. So, no, I, I don't, but we, we, we strongly suspect Sorry, sorry, that's Is Isabel who and Eric who? What? That, oh, joint work that. with Eric Larson and Isabel Vogt. Isabel, who will be speaking next hour. So, uh, more more questions about the the statement of the theorem or the corollary? Yeah, you you said you you were about to say you strongly believe something, but but you never finished. Oh yes, I, I strongly believe that. Um, sigma E is irreducible when C is a general um, uh, curve of gonality K. And I actually this is proved um, in the trigonal case. Uh, one okay. more question. Oh, another you know, question? Yes. So do you know the uh, Description of how these components intersect. Are there some partial progress? Right. Yeah. So you would take the um, the two things in the uh, partial ordering, and that would be where they intersect. I'm sorry. Uh, the, a part right, of right, your right. video got cut off a bit. Can you? Oh. Again? So um, if you want to know where the closures of uh, sigma. E and sigma F uh, intersect, it's going to be uh, another splitting locus for the splitting type, which is uh, maximal among, well, it'll be union of the splitting loci of the maximal elements uh, that are less than or equal to E and F. Ah, OK. Thank you. Do you know whether the intersection is like generically transverse or something like this? or? Um, no. Okay, that's expected, I guess. Okay, thank you. Does your con oh, conjecture yes. about uh, irreducibility hold for dimension zero components? No, sorry. Defin definitely, um, the, I, I strongly believe it is irreducible when its dimension is positive. Yeah. In fact, in the trigonal case, um, I can Hi. count uh, when it should have dimension zero, I can count how many um, points are in it. And it's given by some binomial coefficient. Um, but actually, maybe since I think I just have five minutes uh, left, uh, let me uh, skip to the proof of non-emptiness of, of these loci, which I think uh, will relate to some questions about uh, uh, this um, expected dimension zero as well. So right, to, to prove this statement, there's sort of two parts. We want to bound the dimension from above, and we want to show that these are non-empty, because uh, once they're non-empty, they always have at least the expected dimension. Um, so this is going to be the proof of non-emptiness. So to prove this, 
I wanted to use unexpected class calculation. And some of my previous work gives universal formulas for the classes of splitting loci. And when we apply them in this context, they give us um, expected is for these sigma e bar. And it turns out that they always have the form some uh, number times the power of the theta divisor. And the, these numbers, uh, right, in the, in the case when um, the expected dimension is zero, these numbers correspond to um, how many points there should be in sigma e. And in general, um, these universal formulas are pretty difficult to compute with. And it's uh, hard to uh, compute what this number should be. Uh, but Something quite interesting is that this number depends only on the splitting type. Um, it is independent of the genus. So I had the following sequence of ideas, which is that AE is non zero, then when the genus is at least U of E, this expected class is non-zero. Uh, and so we learn that sigma E is non-empty. But also, if we suppose that uh, I have some E prime less than or equal to E, and I knew somehow that the mystery number AE prime was non zero, then for G, at least U of E prime, the expected class for sigma E prime would be non zero. So sigma E prime would be non empty. But that's contained in sigma e bar. So sigma e bar is not empty. But then if it's not empty, and supposing we already know how to prove it has the expected dimension, its class must be non-zero. So in fact, I learned then that AE is non-zero. So if AE prime was non-zero, I learned that AE is non-zero. And then to finish, we observe that for every E, there exists some N so that the splitting type where I have a minus N and then less balance below E in the partial ordering. And this is a particularly nice splitting type where I can actually compute with these universal formulas. And direct computation shows that the mystery number for this splitting type is one over the expected codimension factorial, which is non zero. So all of the AE are non zero, and therefore all of my splitting loci are non empty when expected. So I'll, I'll end here. Thank you.
Yeah, so you can you can unmute yourself and clap uh, for Hannah or click the clap button and lots of people are doing that. Um, and some people were clapping throughout your entire talk. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh. Attendee of the Comic Con. Um, thank you for that wonderful talk, Hannah. Uh, all right, so, so uh, are there any questions for the speaker? So you can either uh, raise your hand to ask a question and, and wait for Hannah to call on you or, uh, or type into chat. Um, Aaron, I can't tell. Are you clapping or, or raising your hand? Um, oh, so, so Carl Leon asks, is there an explicit algorithm to compute the constant AE? Uh, not that I know. Well, I can give you an algorithm, but it is computationally infeasible. Um, this is, I think this is an interesting question and um, we have some, we have a conjecture for some um, combinatorial uh, gadget that uh, if you count how many there are, that corresponds to um, the number AE. So Samir Canning asks if a fulton Lazisfeld type argument gives connectedness of these loci when dim is bigger than zero. So it's quite difficult to um, adapt the fulton Lazarsfeld connectedness argument to these degeneracy loci for, um, for most splitting types. Um, because although they're um, intersections of loci where uh, different maps of vector bundles drop rank, um, those intersections are not transverse. And so uh, I, I haven't seen a way to make the um, Fulton-Lazarsfeld connectedness work for um, general splitting loci. All right, are there any other questions for the speaker? Well, if not, let's uh, thank her again. And, uh, and uh, let's reconvene at uh, 3.45, so that's in seven minutes. So 3.45 Eastern time, sorry. So that's in seven minutes uh, for the final talk of the day by Isabel Vogt. And thank you again, Hannah.